Thank you. People are coming in. Got quite a nice crowd tonight. I think there's about 16 or 17 people extra. There might be a few more actually. Hi, everybody. Hi. Now, then, I just need to check. <sighs> Sorry, I'm just checking my emails. I've got someone asking why they can't get into Zoom. Let me just sort this out. Hi. Um, Not always the way. Just when you think you've sorted everything out, uh, something goes slightly wrong. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming along. It's really nice uh, to see you. Yes, yeah, Steve says, please do feel free to jump into onto the chat and share your thoughts on the poets because we've got a lot of poets tonight, a lot of poets and our fantastic columnists who are going to give readings and the absolutely phenomenal Steve Ely, Steve Eli, Steve Ely, King of the Eels, is going to be reading for us tonight as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, do feel free to pop into chat and tell us where you are and um, uh, make comments about the readings and applaud and all of that sort of thing. I'll do some housekeeping first. Um, if you're not used to Zoom, which you most likely are at this point after two years in a pandemic, more, two and a half years in a pandemic, um, you can mute yourselves and unmute yourselves using the mute button which should be on the bar at the bottom of your screen on the bottom left hand side there's also a stop video button and if you press that it blacks out your video screen we also have in the bottom bar there is a little section called reactions and if you press on that you'll see all the different emojis and they've got your little clappy emojis and smiley emojis so feel free to use them whenever you want to I will ask you to remain muted if you can while we're doing the readings, um, just so that we don't get any background noise. Um, and I think that's it. If you get knocked out, use the same link to come back in and I'll see you in the waiting room and I'll let you back in. If I get knocked out, not physically, not like someone's going to come in and punch me, but if my internet goes down, um, I will also use the same link and you, I will see you in the waiting room, sir. So. Yes, and I think that's it. And I, um, that's all the housekeeping I need to give. Now then, so here we are again, issue five, five issues in of Spelt Magazine. And we are learning with every issue about where this magazine is going and the potential for the magazine. And we are growing and honing our skills with it. We make mistakes sometimes, but we feel like this magazine and the um, movement that is spelt, the movement that is spelt, is something to be really, really proud of. We have big plans for spelt. We want it to be more than just a magazine. We've got plans to um, create a sort of a spelt school of nature writing, which will have um, all different sorts of courses and workshops as, as part of it. But also we hope to offer some skills-based um, workshops that are aimed at people who haven't had the advantage of perhaps going to university or doing publication courses or all of that sort of stuff so that we can reach people that are having a non-traditional route into writing and we feel that lots of working class people in particular and people that are dis more disadvantaged and those voices that aren't automatically part of the canon of nature writing I guess you might say get a chance to actually find the skills to submit and share a place at the table we're very very keen to create a platform where people can come and um, share their experiences of the rural experience which isn't we're trying to move away from that sort of slightly romanticized um, observational point of view with nature writing and I think we're doing that quite well we need to uh, do quite a lot with reaching different audiences but that's sort of a slow growing thing 
we want it to be more than just a magazine that was just another literature magazine, another poetry magazine. We want you to do something different. We want to make a difference with Spelt. And I, and I think we're doing that. So thank you so much for coming along and supporting us tonight. The reason we have ticketed this event for a pound is so that we can stop trolls coming into um, the Zoom space. I've seen that quite a lot recently in other events. So we don't, the last thing we want is for you to have far too much of a good time when people start sharing porn on the site so we've kept it ticketed so you, you don't have to face that you, you can just have a, a nice nature-based um, launch of the magazine so um, let me introduce you now to my co-editor Steve Nash who I'm sure is dying to get a word in edgeways Steve say hello hello everyone that's me uh, but no, hi everyone. Yeah, great to see so many people here. Uh, readers, I don't know what I can add possibly to to Wendy's announcement there. Apart from, I don't know about you. I keep hearing about all these launches that are being trolled by porn. I still haven't experienced one. And for someone whose work has been largely based for the past few years on Zoom, I feel quite. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but why am I not being trolled with porn on, a, on an almost constant basis? I've no idea. Um, but apart from that, everything is well with me. Um, I'd like to go through all of you and ask how you all are. But I think then Wendy might tell me off. Uh, she always she likes to throw me the mic and say that I'm dying to get a word in edgeways. And then I can see it on her face that she really she starts to really regret it as I start to go on and on. She starts to wonder when I'm going to stop. But I will stop there. Thank you so much for coming. And yeah, I'll scrolling through the poems so if anything goes horribly wrong there visually uh that is entirely my fault just to let you know but for the poets involved as i always say take that as a compliment it usually happens at least once per launch but that's usually because i've been so taken away by your reading of your poem that i've forgotten that i actually have a job to do in the process of reading it so i apologize but as ever with anything i ever do wrong take it as a compliment uh and yeah thank you let's get on with it yeah, let's do it. Yeah, Steve's going to be share, screen sharing the poems tonight in the um, columns or your writing and we are recording this event and it will appear on our YouTube channel. So if you don't want to appear with your camera on, uh, switch your screen off so we can't see you if you are not wanting to appear on the YouTube channel. Okay, I think that's everything. Thank you for coming. Let's, let's make a start, shall we? All right. Let's see, who have we got up first? We have got Rowena, Rowena Somerville. Make yourself known to me, unmute yourself. There now you then. go. Hi. Hello, hi Rowena, this is Rowena. And Rowena, I know actually because she comes to my stanza group. So it was an absolute joy to get a poem from her this um, submissions window and to see that it's about somewhere that I know, <coughs> excuse me, Cloughton. So I'm really, really pleased about that. And also just, it's a beautiful, beautiful poem, but I have to make this uh, big apology really, because I have absolutely cocked up and put the wrong biog on Rowena's page in the magazine. So many, many, many apologies for that. We do proof, we proof and proof and proof because we know we've made a mistake with someone's name in the past. So we were so on it this time and we have managed to miss this big thing. So I'm really, really sorry about the, that, Rowena. <clears throat> so let me introduce as you. As I say, as long as you're feeling bad enough, that's honestly, okay. Honestly, we have just been in tears almost over it. <laughs> <laughs> the guilt, oh, the shame. But we will rectify because we're print on demand after the first uh, print run. In the next print run, we will rectify that. So I'm going to start sending in my poems in a in a threatening manner, like people you mentioned <laughs> before. I, you know, <laughs> that's what I'll do. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> okay, let me introduce Rowena proper properly. Rowena Somerville is a writer, illustrator and singer who lives on a clifftop in beautiful North Yorkshire. She has worked in the arts all her life, has written and illustrated children's books with Hutchinson and Random and has contributed poems to children's and adults anthologies and magazines. Melusine, her first adult poetry collection was published by Mudfog 
in September 2021. She's currently visual artist in residence at the High Window, which is a fantastic magazine. She sings with a four woman a cappella group, Henwen. And I am so delighted to have you here. Take, take it away, away, Rowena. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be in Spelt, even if I'm not quite totally in, in Spelt. Uh, the poem is mine, the picture is mine, and the pictures of the stones are mine. I live in Robinards Bay in North Yorkshire, and about 10 miles down the road from me is Cloughton. It's a kind of relatively undistinguished outburb of Scarborough with a lot of uh, forestry commission land. But in the Forestry Commission land, there are some jewels, and uh, that's what this is about. This is at Cloughton. At Cloughton, just one field over from the insistent traffic of the coast road, in a boggy corner between regulation pine and grazing sheep, the stones huddle and crouch. Their feet are buried deep there is no towering majesty. Their surfaces are pocked and stained. There is no sleek grandeur, and yet, and yet, their compacted silence, their hidden intent, their dense centuries of worship, meaning, portent, stun us with a power we must allow and acknowledge that makes us small. Thank you so much. I absolutely you. love that. Absolutely love it. Because I, I know the stones that you're talking about as well. Just beautiful. Okay, next up we've got um, Carl Tomlinson. Hmm. Carl, can you make yourself known to me, please? Can you unmute yourself and speak? I can do both of those things, yeah. Hello. Hi, Hi. lovely to see you. Hello. You. Yeah, Carl's poem is absolutely brilliant. We love it. One of the things that we're trying to do with Spelt is create, <clears throat> I'll capture, I'm sorry. I've suddenly got a real frog in my throat just at the wrong time. One of the things we're trying to do with Spelt is to provide a platform where people can express the real working rural environment as well as the sort of visiting rural environment. The rural environment is not just a, a sort of a parkland to visit, it's a working place where with working people. So I'm really pleased to have Carl with us tonight to read his a fantastic poem, Lethland Takeaway. Let me introduce him properly. Carl Tomlinson lives on a small holding in rural Oxfordshire. His poems have appeared in Orbis South, The Alchemist Spoon and the Hope Valley Journal. Carl's debut pamphlet, Changing Places, was published in 2021 by Fairacre Press. Helen Mort says of it that it challenges us to move beyond a naive appreciation of the natural and recognise the ways that our landscapes have been profoundly altered by human presence. And that is a, just a brilliant thing to do and I'll be looking out that collection to read myself. So thank you, Carl. Take it away. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, it's lovely to be here and, and to be part of this, this launch of, of, of something so special. I'm, I'm going to give James Rebanks his due by just reading a few lines from his book, English Pastoral. Many British people have lost the taste and cooking skills for things that can be produced sustainably in their own landscapes. The mutton from the older sheep that have reached the end of their breeding lives would have no market at all, but for the British Asian community. The old farmers in our valleys know exactly when the festival of Eid begins. It isn't lambs of God that keep these pleasant pastures green. It isn't John Bull's mutton chops that heft the herdwick to Matterdale's slopes. It's Metigosh and Keenan that pay the fee bills on these farms. It's Friday night on the curry mile, iftar's warmth and ready smiles that mend the walls and fix the styles. Fantastic. I do love it when a poem 
uh, shrinks an experience down, um, distills it into a small space, and it becomes really, really powerful. So thank you so much, Carl, for that. And next up, how exciting, we have one of our brand new columnists. <clears throat> We take on four new columnists every year. This is our second year, so these are our new columnists and we are very, very excited to have them here. Um, Ruth, I'm gonna introduce Ruth properly to you in a minute, but I was immediately, when she put her application in, I was immediately um, entranced by her writing and her story and the way that she looks at the world. It's beautiful writing and it is a real joy to um, have this in the magazine. And also, I'm so looking forward to seeing what she comes up with nice next. We've got a, a whole year of really good quality writing to look forward to. Ruth, are you there? Can you make yourself known to me? There she uh, is. Yes. Hello, yes, hi. hi. Let me introduce you properly. <clears throat> so Ruth Bradshaw works in environmental policy and has been a regular conservation volunteer for over a decade. She's currently writing a book about the value of urban wildlife, which draws on both her professional expertise and her volunteering experiences. Her essay, Stories of Coexistence, was recently shortlisted for the Future Places Prize, and her creative nonfiction has also been published in a variety of websites and journals, including Canary Lit Mag, The Clearing and The Selkie. When not writing or working, she can often be found in the woods near her home in South London. And she is on Twitter as well. I'll share the Twitter handles later on so that you can follow everyone. Um, Ruth, I'm so absolutely delighted to have you here and delighted that you've chosen to come and read for us tonight. Take it away. Great, thank you. And I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to be here and to have the opportunity to write for Belt as well. So my columns are about my experiences as a conservation volunteer in London and about really the idea of, I suppose it's about experience, the, the experiencing the rural in the urban is, is what I'm writing about. Um, so this first column is called Spring Signs and Hopes. Rat tat tat. I turn and scan the branches overhead, but the drumming immediately stops and I can't tell exactly where it was coming from. As soon as I turn away, there it is again, rat tat tat. And again, it stops when I turn to look. This happens a few times before I go grow bored of the game and walk on. Of course, the woodpecker isn't playing games, just getting on with life. And all around me, there are more sights and sounds of life as buzzing insects and black thorn blossom proclaim the arrival of spring and spring wood. Surrounded by trees and with bird song obscuring the sound of traffic, I already feel miles away from the busy high street I walked along a few minutes ago. The names of many of the nearby streets, Woodland Way, Copps Avenue, Oaklands Avenue, bear witness to the fact that this whole area was once covered in trees. Springwood and the adjoining wood somehow survived the area's development, the boundary between them now marking the border of two London boroughs, as well as a change of ownership. My destination today is neighbouring Three Halfpenny Wood, which got its name when a man's body found in the pond could only be identified by the three halfpennies in his pocket, or so the story goes. I'm here with Croydon TCV, the conservation volunteers, on one of our regular visits to help replicate the kind of woodland management that would have been carried out for centuries before the wood became a source of suburban solace rather than fodder and firewood. Our main task is thinning out the holly, as there's, 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 as there's so much of it in some places here that is stopping sunlight from reaching the woodland floor. Removing smaller holly trees and the lower branches of larger ones will give the bluebells and other woodland flowers more chance to grow. It's scratchy, but deeply satisfying work. After an hour or so, we stop for a tea break and it's then while chatting to some of the other volunteers, I spot a splash of bright orange among the dark brown roots of an upturned tree. Initially, I mistake it for a small piece of wind blown plastic. Then I realize it's a comma butterfly basking in the sunshine. With its wings open, I can't see the comma shape on the underwing for which it's named, but I recognize the distinctive bumpy edge to its wings. Soon afterwards, I spot the yellow brimstone flitting through the clearing. These are my first butterfly sightings of the year. Both are among the few species which overwinter in the UK as adults, so they're often the first to appear when the weather warms up. It's a delight to see the butterflies flying again, 
a sign that spring really is on the way. But my pleasure is mixed with concern that an unusually sunny March may have led them to emerge too early. And when it turns really cold again, just two weeks later, and the first of the April showers fall as sleet and snow, I worry even more for the butterflies. According to folklore, seeing an orange butterfly is said to be a sign of joy ahead, something that's sorely needed in the world right now. I don't know whether it's due to the butterfly sightings, the effect of all that physical activity, or simply the hours spent among the trees, but I do know I'm feeling a lot more hopeful by the time we finish for the day. On my walk home, I pause for a moment to capture that feeling before I step out of the woods and return to the city once more. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much, Ruth. I really, really enjoyed that. What interesting uh, job to do. Just fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so next up, we have got Dale. Dale, can you make yourself known to me? Can you speak, please? There he is. Hi. Hi. Hello, Dale. Ah, yeah, this is one of the urban rural ones. Steve, did you want to introduce this? I certainly can, yeah. Um, not, not to bemoan my, my wonderful privilege getting to select these poems, but yeah, our, our urban rural section is, is, is short. We don't have much room at all. Um, and it does make it a challenge to select the poems, but I will say that this month in particular, um, as I was going through highlighting, sort of like going through a pile of like, oh, maybes, definites, definites, maybes, um, the ones that ended up in the magazine were the ones I immediately, that stopped me short. There was something about each of them that just, just immediately grabbed me. And that's really rare um, for me. Often I'll go back and forth and, you know, see wonderful writing, but it's really rare that I see things that just absolutely floor me. Um, and this was certainly one of those. So delighted to be able to have this in the magazine. Um, but I'll, I'll throw it over to Dale. I'm really looking forward to hearing this one. Um, just before you do, Dale, let me just introduce you with your own bio. Uh, and I'll just say that, yeah, absolutely fantastic choices in the urban, urban rural. Steve has absolutely done a fantastic job. And I particularly like this one because of how it's using the uh, space on the page and how it's using embedding the white space within the poem. I love the way that you've done that. I think it's just very skillfully done. Dale, Dale Button, he, him, is a 26-year-old queer poet from Birmingham. His poetry has been published in various places, such as Verve, Young Poets Network, Legia, Queerlings, Famidan, Tea Light, Press, Strike, Spelt, oh, Spelt, that's us, <laughs> Acid Bath Publishing and Muswell Press. He is currently working on his first pamphlet, and if it's anything like this, quality-wise, it will be uh, fantastic. So take it away, Dale. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nan as sunflower. Each morning she rises, stretches before the sun, yawns, pushes out of herself to chance that first soft touch of comfort. The leafy quilt, petaled pillows positioned as yellow almonds, with halo of starry fire, voice as blue blanket sky, beacon body of days. Sometimes the day is a glass of water poured out slowly over the grass. Others, it is a bucket, but the oven days, gas marked low or medium or high, those are the days and nights of fragrant emptiness, but not of loneliness, not in its entirety. Where the other flowers have grown older, have long bent to limpness, cracked stems have withered away into the recess of the compost heap, and their smell, their smell, it carries like warm morning breath, the breeze saying survivor. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Dale. Really, really enjoyed that. Okay. Um, and another on the urban rural, Steve, it's Carol Bromley next. Do you want to introduce her? Yes, there sorry, I was just un unmuting. No, right. I'm giving you too many jokes, it's, sorry. It's too much for me to cope with <laughs> all at once. Um, yeah, a, a mysterious one, this, Carol Bromley. I mean, who is she? Uh, we've never encountered her in this magazine or, or ever before, so it's hard to introduce. But 
I'll be honest, again, one of, one of the issues about, you know, putting, putting together magazines, there's, there's always the challenge where um, I think we do a relatively good job to pat ourselves on the back again about getting kind of new voices or emerging, that's the popular word for it, isn't it, poets um, and established poets. And every now and then, part, part of me will see an established poet name, which, you know, I mean as a compliment, absolutely, Carol, but I think, yeah, um, we, we I, so even you will acknowledge that now, that we can call you established in some way. Um, <laughs> but even when, when I see the established, an established poet's name, I think, well, I'm going to, you know, probably not, do this one because there'll be some emerging poet and you know if it's if it's 50 50 then let's give someone new a chance but unfortunately often particularly when uh, people have the talent like carol does and the craft that goes into her writing there's no argument to be had it's simply one of the best poems that i got sent for the section um and once again i don't know i feel like there's some sort of witchcraft going on because i don't know how carol is consistently able to produce this kind of writing when i feel like i'm consistently able to manage one every decade at the rate i'm going so far um and i'm sort of happy with that uh but yes i i will stop wittering and let wendy introduce you properly yeah, thank you, Steve. And yes, I absolutely echo everything that Steve says about Carol's work, which is consistently high quality and beautiful. She has a very elegant style. Um, I've known Carol for a while and she runs uh, the York Stanza Group and is just one of the good ones in the poetry community who helps a lot of people as well. So Carol, let me introduce you properly. Carol Bromley lives in York, where she is the stanza rep and runs poetry surgeries. She writes for children as well as adults. Winner of a number of prizes, including the Bridport and the Hamish Canham Award. She has three collections with Smith Darstop and won the Peregrine Falcons of York Minster with Valley Press 2020, as well as a recent pamphlet, Sodium 136 from Calder Valley Poetry. Calder Valley Poetry is a really nice press as well, and that collection Sodium 136 is just phenomenal. Do do get hold of it and read it. Carol, your beautiful poem, please take it away. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. I, I haven't appeared yet on the screen, but at least not on my screen. Oh, Carol, we can see it. Could everyone oh, else see it? That's fine. That's fine. Then I'll start. I can't see myself, which is probably a blessing. Thank you for the lovely things you said. Um, I wrote this poem um, in January. I was doing um, Claire Shaw and Kim Moore's, you know, morning um, writing hours, which were wonderful. Um, and uh, we had to just look out of the window. And I'm sure, you know, Claire Shaw said, I'm going to look, out, I'm going to write about the moor because I can see it. I'm going to write a poem in the voice of the moor. So you look out the window. Of course, if I look out of my window, the first thing I see is a chimney pot. But, you know, <laughs> that's what comes with living in a town. So I decided to write in the voice of the aerial on top of the chimney pot. Aerial. I quiver in the cold air, listening for your voice. Send me a song to unscramble. I'm silhouetted against a blue sky and it is January again. A blackbird perches briefly, warbles his aria to morning, departs. I'm deaf to him, deaf to that silver plain, to fox bark and child's cry. Tuned only to your sound waves, I know a sudden gale could blow me to silence. Oh, send me one message. I am tensed for the sound of your voice. Just beautiful. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, okay. Next up, we've got Richard Lambert. Richard, will you make yourself known to me? Speak. Hi, Wendy. Hello. Hi. Hi. There you are. Hi. Thank you very much for coming along and reading for us tonight. Um, another poem that really, really struck me as being something a bit different and a bit interesting, which is what we like in a magazine. Um, I shall introduce you properly, Richard. Richard Lambert lives in Norfolk. He had poems in the TLS, Poetry Island Review, Poetry Review and the Rialto. Wow, that is some uh, CV. His second collection is The Nameless Places. 
ARC 2017. His debut novel for young adult readers, The Wolf Road, was a 2020 book of the year in The Guardian, Financial Times and Sunday Times, was long listed for the Carnegie Prize and won the Malpete Award. The Irish Times called it a love letter to nature. How fantastic, what fantastic CV. We are absolutely buzzing to have you here, Richard, to read your poem to us tonight. Please do so, thank you. Thank you. Th thanks very much, Wendy and Steve, for including my poem in Spelt. I was really delighted, thank you. Um, I, I write quite a lot of poems about out, the outskirts of the towns uh, in Norfolk where I live. Um, and this poem came from, well, it started with me seeing a, um, um, a, a massive sopping wet sofa that somebody, some people had left just at the side of a country path. Um, I put wells, wells near the sea, wells next to the sea on the North Norfolk coast. And um, I've sort of compiled a letter from that. I sort of made a list of rubbish really that I've seen, at, you know, at the edges of towns um, around here. Um, and it, oh, the other thing to say about it is it's also a response or kind of like a riff on W.B. Yeats's poem, um, Beautiful Lofty Things. And my one is called Ugly Low Down Things. Blue crisp packets blown along with leaves, sopping sofas fit for Carolingian kings, Reader's Digest magazines. White bullets of styrofoam packaging, knotted bags of unknown matter, and then, as you approach them, of fecal matter. An oily, link-snapped bicycle chain. A shopping list in pencil with crossings out in ink. All the gutters, sloughed off skins, all the lost and foxed, and low-down crap that's meant for bins. Things never known again. Thank you. Oh, that's phenomenal. Really, really good. Really, really like that. And thank you for sharing with us the process as well in creating that poem. I think it's uh, always fascinating to hear where writers get their poems from. So thank you very, very much for being with us uh, tonight. OK, next up, we have got Penny Sharman with uh, another really, really good poem. I love a bit of ekphrastic poetry, and this is that. Penny, can you make yourself known to me, please? There Hello, she is. Hi, Penny. Hi. Hi. Hi, lovely to have you here tonight. And Thank another you for Penny, me. I, I know sort of through social media and various bits and pieces, I, I sort of know Penny and know that she is a fantastic writer. So I'm delighted that we have her in the magazine, uh, this issue, and with such a stunning poem as well. Penny, let me introduce you properly. Penny Sharman is a published poet, photographer, artist and therapist. She is inspired by wild natural landscapes and the relationships between the seen and the unseen. Penny has an MA in creative writing from Edge Hill University. She's had many poems published in magazines such as The Interpreter's House, Strix, The North, Obsessed with Pipework, Finnish Creatures, Orbis and Ink, Sweat and Tears, Mislexia, Marble, Beautiful Dragons. Penny's uh, got several collections of poetry, uh, one with Yaffle Press, and uh, what's your latest one? The Day Before Joy, De December 2020, with Knives, and Knives, Forks and Spoons Press. Oh yeah, Knives, Forks and Spoons Press. And do go out afterwards, after this reading, after these um, brilliant poets and columnists have read their work, do go out and find them on social media and look up their websites because you're just, it's a joy to go and find more poems by people who you appreciate. God, I'm waffling, sorry. Penny, please do us the honour of reading your poem. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot, Wendy and Steve, for putting me in your magazine. I've tried it a few times, so thanks for this. This poem I wrote quite a long time ago, which I, I do quite like. I was on holiday in Linton and there was a, this painting was on the cottage wall. So really that's how I came to write it. The Milkmaid, after Vermeer, 1657. She had the technique, the art of pouring milk from the jug quiet strength of ability in her eyes and in her manly hands. Here's a still life of cloth 
in her yellow bodice and blue skirt. Here's the bread and basket, an arrangement of hours spent out of the foot warmer into the frozen Dutch polders. Her mouth may sing, may curse, may sob as each drop of milk falls in a statued line into the sop tureen as day after day the artisans glide on the ice behind her back. The world of finery lies out of reach from the rustic bread baskets of a scullery life. Thanks. Absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much for reading that. I really, really enjoyed that one. <laughs> just a lovely, quiet poem, but carrying so much weight and so much power. Just lovely. Um, okay, next up we've got Will Patton. Will, can you make yourself known to me? Can you speak, please? Yeah, hi. Hi, Wendy. Thanks. Hey, well, hi. Hello. Um, I just wanted to uh, tell you that uh, this is my mum's favourite poem out of the magazine, and oh, she hi. doesn't she doesn't even like poetry. So you <laughs> you won around. Well done, you. Congratulations. Hey. I couldn't do it with my poetry, but you that have. That was my intention from the beginning was just. To <laughs> crack really. That one. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, but I, this another one of those poems where. We, when we get to open our submissions windows, we usually get about 400 individual pieces of work sent to us. So it's a lot of work to read through. And you can imagine how difficult it then is to choose just, uh, I think we usually put about 20 pieces of poetry and a few pieces of creative nonfiction as well in the magazine. So to get down to that small amount of poems, you have to have something about the poem. I always think that uh, when I look for poems I'm looking for something that makes me feel like I've stepped down a step that isn't there. And it's something internal. It makes your heart sort of jump in your chest. And this is one of those because I sort of recognise this scene. I recognise this scene. This is almost somewhere where I've been. It's almost a, a world that I know, but not quite. And I just think to be able to craft this into a poem and to keep that narrative going within a poem is a really skillful thing to do. I just think it is a, a superb poem. And I am... Absolutely, so looking forward to hearing you read this. So uh, let me introduce you properly. <clears throat> Will Patton was born in Wolverhampton and grew up in Staffordshire. He gained his MFA in the United States at the University of Arkansas. His work has appeared in the Manchester Review, Bare Fiction, Ink, Sweat and Tears, The Moth, and Fawn Press Anthology Elements, Natural and Supernatural. He currently lives in London where he works in education. And I am going to hand you over to Will now for him to read this absolutely stunning poem. Thank you, Will. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Wendy uh, and Steve for publishing the poem. I really appreciate that. And thanks for thanks for those lovely words as well about the poem. Um, I wasn't expecting that. It's really sweet. So thank you very much. Um, the poem um, is sort of based on yeah my uh teenage experiences living in uh rural staffordshire uh where I, I had a little job as a beta sort of helping on the shoots at the time so uh, it's based on that on that experience <clears throat> well done lads saturday in winter my dad drops me at the farm and we the beaters take seats in the horse box smell of smoke and wax and rolling backy and we're towed to farmers fields I'm 13, but the beaters offer me their flask without a joke attached. After a drink, they start to laugh. They mock this bloke riding his bike behind us, shouting, come on, mate, keep up. Then we're out, marching over frozen furrows through forest, thrashing bushes with sticks until the bushes birth fat pheasants sound like blades spinning. We're silent with the shooting. Like hearing through the wall, my mother whisper, I don't really care what you do. My dad's silence impossible to see. Now the dogs collect the dead. One dog won't let go his pheasant. A beater kicks in. There's a fight. The first I've seen between two adults and it's broken up too quickly. The men are blushing. One spits. The other strokes his dog. Then we're back in the horse box, entwined by threads of smoke from roll-ups, riding to an estate, the distant ruined chapel rising, to go again through woods, through fields. And it occurs to me I've never seen the shooters, not closely, only echoes of posh accents, empty black Range Rovers, and how normal it seems, this task of death, how refined like those men's voices, and how when the fox appears and we shout to tell them fox and they all shoot, 
her wild red body ragged as if held and shaken. I'll not think of this again, I know. I'll not think of this again. Just the promise of a hot bath and the ghost of a tenor in my pocket. Thanks. Fantastic. One of the things I really like about that poem is the complexity of it and the way that you move it through the different perspectives, which I think is really, really good. Just fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, Wendy Klein next. Wendy, can you make yourself known to me? I think I have. Yes, I'm, there you are. Yeah. I see you. I hear you. Hi, Wendy. Hi, hi. Hi. Yeah, we are really, really pleased to have you with us tonight. Um, another one of those poems that jumped out at me and that I've been looking forward to the launch to hear you read. Um, let me introduce you properly. <clears throat> Wendy Klein's most recent pamphlet, Let Battle Commence, Dempsey and Window 2020, is based on her paternal great-grandfather's letters home when he was serving as a Confederate soldier in the US Civil War. Oh, that sounds fantastic. I'm going to look that up and get it. Previous collections are Cuba in the Blood and Anything in Turquoise from Cinnamon Press, Mood Indigo from Oversteps Books, 2016, and Out of the Blue Selected Poems from the High Window Press, 2019. And Wendy is another one of those poets who I see around on social media and pick up on and watch for their news, and someone who is really well respected in the poetry community. So it was lovely to be able to accept some work from her and to have her come along and read with us tonight. So Wendy, if you would do us the honor of reading your poem, thank you. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Wendy. I think I only began to appreciate rural, semi-rural life on coming to England. After living in London for eight years, I couldn't wait to get back to the country. Thank you to Spelt, to you and Steve for accepting my Badger poem. I love Badgers, best appreciated alive at night in their sets. This poem is a real incident. Burden. With the stiff parcel in his arms, even the cows would have eyed him with suspicion so early. Clutching his unwieldy burden, a dead badger, he'd stuffed into a garden refuse bag, his walk along the electric fence taking too long, the sound his feet made on the scatter of dry leaves that edges the lane, a clamor indecent under a new dawn sky. He'd have set the thing down halfway home, rested his arms by the old dairy, heard the stable clock creak seven, just a tad further to go, past the dry stone wall, its stenciling of last year's figs like a string of burnt out fairy lights. He might have shoved it into next door's wheelie bin, that house still dark, but then too late, a flicker in an upstairs window. Just a few paces to go across the car park, the giveaway mutter of gravel underfoot, and he'd have slid it into his own empty bin, flinched at the thunk it made. Poor beast, told her later, how troubled he'd felt, almost like a criminal, how any of us might have run the beast down in the night, but no sign of blood on his own bumper, no fresh dents on any of the vehicles hunched up in the half-lit space. he checked, just fate. Fantastic, thank you. I've so rarely seen badgers, uh, live badgers. I've seen uh, probably two or three times in my life, always at night. Mm. But you see them so often dead at the side of the road, don't you? It's awful. Okay, so next up we have Chris Kinsey. Chris, can you make yourself known to me? Can you speak, please? Yes. Hi. Hi, Wendy. There you are, um, I see you. Hello, Chris, hi. Hello. Nice, nice to, to have you with you us. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so this is another one of those poems where I looked at it and thought, yeah, this is this is a nice shaped poem. This is a really well crafted poem, and so doing something a bit different, doing something different with poetry. I look for things that uh, jump out and feel some, make you feel something with poetry. And so often with uh, with nature poetry in particular, and this uh, landscape poetry, it because it is. A, a descriptive, observative, observative, that's not even a word, act. And I 
find when I find poems like this that are doing something different, that are building a, um, an image and growing it, it really does something to me. So I'm really, really pleased. I'm waffling so much. I'm so sorry. I'm really, really pleased that Chris Kinsey is with us tonight to read this fabulous poem. And I'm going to introduce you properly now and stop waffling. Chris Kinsey grew up in Herefordshire, but always wanted to head for the hills. After a degree at Bretton Hall, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, she settled in Mid Wales. She has five published poetry collections. Her most recent, from Rowan Waite Ridge, put my teeth in, 2019, was commissioned by Fairacre Press for its focus on border landscapes. She wrote a regular nature diary for Cambria magazine and won Camroos, Nature Camroos Inspired by Nature competition and absolutely deserves it because quality is fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris, for coming along and reading tonight. Thank you very much for that, Wendy, and thank you for including me in. This is actually the poem from issue two. I think, do you want me to read that one or shall I read the one that's in, in five that is called Vanishing Canal? I'm happy to read either. <laughs> you know what, this is my fault entirely because I've sent these over to Steve. No, read your, read your new one in this issue, please, Chris. Okay, this is in a different voice and it's about um, a branch of the canal that used to go into the town of Shrewsbury but to, to serve a, a flax mill. But I think it was seeped, it seeped away in the 60s. It's called Vanishing Canal. I played a part in letting it go. The water wanted to be loosed free and those sluice paddles cried out to be cranked. I loved the gush and rush as it ran over itself, roaring under the road down into the overspill. Waves set the moorhens rocking and coots narking. Both shunted back to their nests we reached through the bulrushes to pluck an egg each and ran back with wet feet to the frying pan. When the lard was spitting, we cracked them in. The whites bubbled and the little yolks kept their beady eyes on us. So we ate them up quick and Billy said, let's hope they were more hens or we'll be bald and mad when we grow up. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And I'm so sorry about that. I'll tell you what it is that's gone wrong with that. It's one of uh, Steve's Urban Rural ones, this one. But that one was one of my ones from the general submissions in, in that issue. So when I looked at it, I knew I looked at it and I thought, yeah, that's, that's definitely Chris's poem. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. Anyway, if you want to find Chris's poem in the latest issue of uh, Spelt Magazine, it's on page 29. And it is really, really, really beautiful. <sighs> I knew we'd make a mistake at some point tonight. So I do apologise and thank you so much for taking it on the chin and reading. Uh, we are going to move now and have a 10 minute break so that you can go and charge your glasses, pour yourself a drink, go for a week, do whatever you want to do in those 10 minutes. It's entirely up to you. You can even go and buy some spelt magazines to give to your friends <laughs> if you want. <laughs> but I shall see you back here in 10 minutes at about eight o'clock. Thank you so much. Thank you. I wasn't.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. How lovely. What a fantastic first half we've had. Some brilliant, brilliant readers and um, just real good quality work. I'm enjoying this so much. And it's such a treat to hear people read in their own voices, isn't it? To read something on the page and it's almost always slightly different to how it is when the poet reads it. It's a, it's a lovely thing, really. Um, okay, so without further ado, let's crack on. Kicking off the second half, who have we got? Andrew F. Giles. There you are. Can you unmute yourself, Andrew, please? I am. Hello. Hi, Hi. lovely to have you here. Um, Andrew you. is another one of our brand new columnists. Oh, the screen's moving. Isn't it? It's lovely, lovely, lovely to have you here and to have you reading your column with us um, today, Andrew. Um, I'm so pleased to, because uh, again, with the columnists, what we want to do with the columnists, we have four columnists every year, and I try to find people who have really different experiences, some more traditional, some less traditional, but really giving um, a sort of a, a range of experiences of what the rural can mean to different people, because it can mean just an immensely different experience to different people. So I was really, really pleased when um, Andrew sent his application in and I got to chat to him and it was a really lovely, easy conversation. I just knew straight away that he would be a good fit for the magazine. And I wasn't wrong because his column is beautiful, nuanced, interesting, brilliant writing. And I'm, I'm just so pleased that we chose you, Andrew, to be one of our columnists. It, it is lovely. Oh, God, I'm really overusing the word lovely tonight. I'm so sorry. Right. Anyway, let me introduce you properly. Andrew F. Giles is a British European writer of poetry and creative nonfiction in which he imagines a queer history of outsiders. This history reaches out across time and culture to find affinity with other queer rural people. He lives at, and works at Graham Farm, a permaculture project, creative residency and safe space for queer folk and their allies in the mountains of northern Spain. Thank you so much, Andrew. Take it away. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, Steve. It's so brilliant to be here. As Wendy says, I'm up in the mountains in northern Spain. It's a really beautiful evening. We've been out in the fields all day, me and the dogs, um, trying to repair the damage after a massive hailstorm. So that's been quite fun. Um, I'm drawn to networks, as Wendy spoke about, real, imagined, literary, across times, across cultures. And I'm just really content to be here with you all. Um, it's a real sense of connection um, up here in the wild. So thank you very much for that. It's really nice. Um, I've put a link for the farm in the chat if you want to have a look. I'd love um, to hear from you or um, you know any connection in the network is always welcome. Um, and I'm just gonna read. There's a word in my article um, that I can't pronounce. <laughs> So wish me luck. Um, this is my first one, Queer Rural Network. Up in the mountains at 3,000 feet, slow bees appear in sunlight, hovering and darting around me like ideas at the beginning of spring. This is, geographically and on the daily, an outsider life, a decision to be self-sufficient in a remote place far from the urban queer community. As a teenager from small town northern Britain, I hurtled towards the city as soon as I could, a headlong sprint for acceptance that left me damaged and precarious. Now, daydreaming as I weed and plant, ideas of observation and exchange swarm about me, reaching out to a faintly buzzing queer network. In late winter and early spring, I spend long and hurried moments pruning trees back and down, sorting different sized branches and trunks into firewood for next year and into fencing, garden steps and rails and cracking twigs into kindling. My eyes engage with the knots and walls, but also with all trees on different terms. Once a, tr a tree stood separate, an aesthetic shape on a landscape, a bag of logs bought and delivered. Walking up to the mountain pastures with my mastiff and mongrel, I began to regard trees through our shared history. A tree is a friend in my network, a constantly self-renewing supply of fuel, a bastion of protection, a source of nourishment. 
they've changed my arc of vision, which once could not sense how laboriously we would be together. Somewhere, the future is written in a poetry of interbeing. Somewhere, there were cities where my queer network was made up of concrete maps and screens. I felt unfit for purpose in every place. Now, across lines of time and space, real and imagined, I'm in touch as I till the land. My hands are warm after dragging them through the earth, through beds stuffed with manure and mulch, rich with worms and beetles surprised from under rocks. It's near planting season. The potatoes will go in with the waning moon. These are the same hands that held pipes to blow ochre, animal blood and saliva onto cave walls, ancient art in the limestone cavities high in the mountains near my farm. The same hands that work the trees. I think of the, there we go, Kangjashi Menji petroglyphs, 4,000 years old, teeming with queer figures. Knowledge of ancient queer folk often extrapolated from queer living in indigenous, pre-Christian or modern day hunter-gatherer peoples is sometimes encapsulated as a third gender or intermediate types. And this is what Edward Carpenter wrote about that in 1914. The intermediate people and their corresponding sex relationships played a distinct part in the life of the tribe or nation and were openly acknowledged and recognized as part of the general polity. I reach into the earth, out across the years, seeking affinity, shared magic. In moments of casual homophobia or feeling unwelcome, I remember, I belong in this place. My queer ancestors guide me. Queerness is at times framed in terms of lack, lack of acceptance, of diversity, of kindness, of medical care, of safety. And these things do not change in climate emergency. Neither is the mountain a place where mental struggle and social minority magically disappear. A meditation teacher from my online group, Cloud Sangha, encouraged me to reach out to my affinity ancestors. And this made powerful sense to me. Being rural and queer might feel like drawing in, but it might be a meditative reaching out to all the queer people who came before and all those who even now have their hands in the earth, queerness unfurling like tree blossoms into a vocal working network of ancient and modern folk who steward the land in shared precarity. Thank you. Thank you, that's absolutely beautiful. And I love this idea of reaching forwards and backwards and finding the people and finding those networks, like you were saying, the connections and the networks, just beautiful and so beautifully done, beautifully crafted writing. Thank you so much. Okay, next up, Lynn Valentine. Hello, hi, Wendy. Hello, hello, hi, hello, hi. hi. Lovely to have you with us tonight. Um, yeah, Wendy, I'm sure you're sick of the sight of me because I had the workshop with you last night. I was like, oh, and I can never be sick of the sight of you, ever, <laughs> ever. Um, oh, I'm so privileged to just be here and hear all this wonderful writing yeah, and everything. It's, of it. it's, just it's lovely, isn't it? Really, really nice. And again, I just love coming across different forms and different styles of writing and seeing what poets are able to do with um, a structure or semi-structure and how they're working it and making it work for them. So it was a real joy to find this one by Lynn. And obviously I, I know Lynn a bit. She, we know each other on social media. We've done, uh, she's come to some of my courses and, and she's doing really, really well as well with publishing. You've just got a new collection out, haven't you, Lynn? That's probably your yes. thing actually, your bio. So let me introduce you properly before I start waffling on again. Lynn Valentine lives in the Scottish Highlands with her husband, dogs and a mountain for a neighbour. Fantastic. She had a debut collection, Life Stink and Honey, published by Cinnamon Press in 2022 after winning the Cinnamon Literature Award. Congratulations, that is a fantastic achievement. Lynn Scott's language pamphlet, A Glimmer of Stars, was published by Hedgehog Poetry Press in 2021 after winning their dialect competition. And they're both really fantastic collections. 
She was runner up in the Scots category of the Wigtown Poetry Prize in 2021. And she is an absolute rising star. And I just genuinely love your work, Lynn. And so it is an absolute joy to have you here tonight and to have you in the magazine and to have you read this poem for us. So please, please take it away, share it with us. Thank you. The wrong kind of hope. Suddenly it was spring as though we'd slept through winter. The snow chased away in a day with warm weather blowing all the way in from the Sahara. Are such things possible to go from snow to desert sun and adjust? I swapped my fur-lined boots for open-toed sandals. Watch the geese confused, their migratory pattern lost for a while. And Valentine's Day steeped in sun as though love itself had brought the heat. The cows and early calves released from the barn, kicking free in the field. Then pasta eaten in the garden instead of indoors. Both of us looking over to bald headed hills, the usual red wine swapped for dry white. Alcohol, a cold and welcome slap to our throats. We miss the snow of old. Winter surrenders, closes the door on itself, leaves us wanting more. Just really, really beautiful and so moving. It's just gorgeous, Lynn. Thank you so much. And so beautifully read as well. I just love hearing you read your poems. Just wonderful. Okay, let's see who we've got next. Susan Butler, Dr. Susan Butler, can you make yourself known to me, please? Can you speak? I can speak. Hello. Hi, Sue. Hi. Lovely to have you here. Okay, yeah, lovely, fantastic. I know Sue's going to introduce this properly, but you know when you come across a poem and you just think, you get drawn into it. This is one of those poems where it is like falling into a poem. I felt like I was falling into this poem when I, when I first read it and it is just absolutely gorgeous. So I'm trying not to talk too much because I think Sue's going to introduce the poem anyway. <clears throat> So let me tell you about Sue. Sue Butler, a retired GP, took up walking and creative writing in retirement. Both unpredictable forms of meditation on life in all its grace, pain and peculiarity. Her pamphlet Learning from the Body is published by Yaffle Press. It reflects the intimate connection general practice brings with many lives, the gift and burden of that connection. Her poems have been published in One Hand Clapping, Poetry and COVID and the Hippocrates Prize Anthology for 2020. And Sue is another one of those poets to look out for because she is really a phenomenal poet, really, really skilled, beautifully crafted poems. So we are lucky to have her here tonight. Sue, take it away. Thank you so much for those kind words, Wendy. Um, Edricillis Bay is a place in northwest Scotland, the very northwest of Scotland, that I've been visiting annually for many years and love. Um, Edricillis, I believe, is Gaelic for the meeting of two waters. Um, and I like to think that someone dear to me who visited this land from the sea rather than by road uh, might have been here. Maybe our experiences met here. Who knows? Edricillis Bay. Earlier, we walked to the waterfall, nine miles on rock harder than bone, the midges mustered in clouds so thick we were spitting them out. Think of Niagara, they said. This is three times as high. From the overhang, I could see only sky and dry brown heather on the other side of the lock. In the pub, we stretch, loll beside the window, watch the breeze fall, the mirror of the evening lock lengthen toward the sea. Our Cullen skink arrives with tomorrow's midge forecast. A fisherman's dog mistimes his leap for the jetty. The splash ripples out to the piled lobster pots left out to dry. The smoker's bench beside the harbour wall where sailors tell tall stories of times gone by. Here, boy, you say, and the dripping dog falls on your feet to be stroked while you smoke the midges away. There, boy, at a boy, an elegant smoky sea curls past the window and quick, seal, 
the black cannonball head passes without a wake, an unhurried stealth bomber past the old midget submarine base. There boy, here boy. A broadside, a starburst of memories flare, fizzle and fall, comfortable as the dog on your feet. The times I searched for you after you'd gone, so many times. The presence I'd read about in books, the sea salt tang of your Guernsey in the hall, your footfall crunching the gravel when you nipped out for a crafty fag. I felt no warmth in your fireside chair, heard no snore in the night. You were absent as midges in winter. Tucked under your Guernsey and a tin of midge powder, I found four diaries, one for each of the times you spent here, the entries terse. Glad to get inside Loch Inch for night, very, very steep swell at sea. You were frail the last time. I'll take a box of matches out, you said, in case of the final nightfall. With care, lest the book fall to pieces. I make a note at bedtime beneath your handwriting, spidery as a midge's leg. Dinner by the sea. Thank you, Sue. <clears throat> and of course, this is a sestina as well. So this is quite a strict poetry form. And it is so cleverly done that you don't, you forget that you're reading it. Just fantastic. Thank you so much, Sue. Just a beautiful, beautiful poem. Okay, next up we have got Joanna Wright. Joanna, there she is. She's already unmuted herself, ready in preparation. So organised. Um, yes. Oh, yes. This is another one that um, I'm going to let you introduce it, actually, Joanna. I'm going to let you introduce your own poem. But it's another one of those poems where I looked at it and I thought, oh, doing something different, doing something interesting, using a form, doing something that takes a shape and expands it or contracts it or, and makes it something different using the page differently and I just absolutely love seeing poets do that and pushing out and pushing boundaries and trying different things and this is one of those poems again that jumped out at me let me just introduce you properly before I start waffling on Joanna Wright lives in Ullapool in the Scottish Highlands. She works as a painter and currently a librarian. Her poetry has been published in Northwards Now and I just love this poem. So please introduce your poem, please, Joanna, and read it for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. And hello, everybody. And it's very lovely to be here. So this is a poem in the golden shovel form. If you don't know it, you start with an existing phrase or a line from somebody else's poem, which you then break down word by word, and you use all those words to finish the lines of the poem that you are writing. So the phrase I've used is from Tithonus by Alice Oswald. Something the same in every hedge doesn't speak like a speech. Something the same in every hedge doesn't speak like a speech. It's morning in the shrubbery. Eloquent something shifts in the black currents. A scrap of breeze or the willow's seeds drifting like drowsy snow, the same slow float as money spiders, distant thunder of a bin being wheeled in. Sparrows stitch their comfortable chat in every underneath of leaf fat hedge. Let the blackbird cling to larch tops, tip his song until it doesn't seem to fly from his bright beak, but speak on the sky's behalf. Chive flowers hatch from pink wrapped paper like an expert gift, like even the modest clover, a green braid across the lawn has decided to make a speech. Really, really beautiful, really, really beautiful and just beautifully crafted as well. I absolutely love this. Thank you so much for sharing it with us and allowing us to print it in the magazine. It's, it's a real honour, it's a real privilege. Okay, on to Elizabeth Wainwright next. Elizabeth, 
make yourself known to me. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi. Hello. Yeah. And Elizabeth is another of our fantastic columnists and another one of those uh, people who I interviewed and found something more interesting in her viewpoint and obviously her writing as well, which is just really high quality, stunning craft, stunning craft work in this. And I'm just so looking forward to seeing your next columns and what you produce over the rest of the year and how you approach it, because it's much different um, writing a column than it is just writing a piece of creative nonfiction. You are, people have sort of expectations of you when you write it. I was a columnist for Yorkshire Life for a while and people sort of have expectations about what you're going to produce. So knowing that you have um, columnists who already think in a really interesting way is is one area of the magazine where I don't have to worry so much about it because I just know these people are going to produce work that is consistently good and Elizabeth is already doing that so I'm really really pleased to have her work in the magazine. Let me introduce you Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a district councillor, coach, walking guide and writer. Her background is in international development and she's lived and worked around the world. She's had work published in Caught by the River and the Elsewhere Journal and Resurgence, Resurgence and Ecologist magazine. She's an alumni of the Rural Writing Institute. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm really, really pleased that you're here to read this for us tonight, Elizabeth. Please do take it away and share it with us. Thank you, Wendy and Steve. It's a really lovely um, evening. Yes, I'm really happy to be part of it. Um, my columns are really, I guess, exploring um, the small patch of Devon I'm in, in mid-Devon, and kind of digging beneath the soil of um, local politics, which is something I accidentally got involved in a few years ago, as well as um, beneath the soil of relationships and other things I'm discovering. So. Yeah, looking forward to um, the, 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 the further columns that I'll be contributing. Um, I'm reading from the version that was printed, Wendy. I think the first paragraph was chopped off, which is the one on your screen. Is that all right? I'll read out. Yeah, time. sorry about that. Really? That's me again, taking right. the wrong version. Carry on. Thank you. Jim and I are not supposed to be friends. He's a 70-something-year-old conservative voting farmer on a local parish council, and I'm a 37-year-old Green Party district councillor. We span divides, generational, background, politics. One spring, we sat down and shared cider. The tractors are having to use GPS, he told me. GPS? To navigate a field? The soil's dusty and blowing everywhere, he said. They can't see. They need help to keep straight lines. It was only April, but the Devon fields were dry. Jim told me what this means for his farm, and I told him of farmers I'd met in my work across Africa. We noticed links between lands and talked about the future of farming. Our relationship is ever deepening, and it, and it is through relationship with Jim and others that my hope is strengthening, divides disappearing, and change happening. The area I cover as a district councillor is made up of rural parishes. I'm sitting at my desk in a village in the parish of Torvale in the district of Mid-Devon. Dairy cows, cows roam the rolling fields outside. On the hill beyond, I can see a barn and a line of trees. Some flourish, some are in decay. I am sitting in an ancient place, ancient by word. Devon comes from the Celtic Damnonii tribe and means deep valley dweller. Ancient by landscape, rural and largely unchanged for centuries and ancient by unit of governance. The root of the word parish speaks of dwelling and neighborhood, and a parish was a way of creating boundaries based on the community that the local church pastor could care for. I've been trying to imagine care and neighborhood as guides for politics today. I was asked to stand in the district council elections in 2019 to give voters more choice. No one expected me to win in long held conservative land, least of all me, when the results rolled in and I realised I'd won, I spat tea all over my laptop. It means I'm a local politician, but this tainted term is an illusion that obscures the possibilities I see. The usual demographic for councillors here is well-retired white men, and I am not like them. I'm not like Jim either, but through our relationship, we've covered a path that joins us. 
cutting through the ease of preconceptions and labels to find the messy but cultivating soil of humanity underneath. These connecting paths have always been here, bound in root and myth, pressed into layers unknown, waiting to be reclaimed and guide us again. I try to walk actual and relational paths daily, finding or making maps as I go. These paths point towards a governance of a parish, a district, a nation that is led by care and relationship, where in the spirit of poet farmer Wendell Berry, it all turns on affection. It's exposing to live at the pace of knowing and being known, but the parish is where physical, relational and spiritual landscapes merge and where relationship can transfigure difference into strength and care. The parish asks me to root here and listen and hope. In my future columns, I'll explore relationship, possibility and politics through the lens of the local parish. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just love this. I love this um, sort of a slow pace, a gentle pace to it and the observations of what's happening and how you fit in or don't fit in into the world that you are existing in. I think it's really beautifully done. So thank you so much. And that, that sort of brings us to the end of the columnists and the poets for tonight and on to our brilliant guest speaker, who is the uh, absolutely brilliant and fantastic Steve Ely, King of the Eels. And I was lucky enough to talk to Steve about his current collection or new collection. I think you've got another one out actually, haven't you? Or coming out. Uh, the European Eel, which is a phenomenal book and... Um, it was just sitting down and talking to someone who puts so much passion into their work and so much research into their work. Steve, I learned a lot from what Steve was saying about how he came, how, how his process worked around building a collection or not exactly building a collection, but physically, almost physically embodying a collection. This collection in particular, the European Eel, it is like Steve has gone into and become in a sort of an animalistic way, become the eel. And I absolutely, so highly recommend this collection. I, I can't stop talking about it to people because it is brilliant. I sat down and almost read it in one big, long, epic, gorgeous chunk because it is so good. And I'm gonna let uh, Steve actually talk about his book and read from his book, but let me introduce him uh, in his own words. Steve Ely teaches, Eli or Ely, I think we'll go with Ely. Steve Ely teaches creative writing at the University of Huddersfield, where he is director of the Ted Hughes Network. He has written 10 books or pamphlets of poetry, the most recent of which are The European Eel with Long Barrow Press and Lectio Violence, Shearsman's Books. And it is an absolute genuine pleasure to have you here tonight, Steve. Will you tell us a little bit about the book before you, you read from it, please? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, it's, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, so basically, um, I heard a little in, introduction to it because it's, it's, the origin of it is so complicated that we'd be here all night, so I'll just put it in a thumbnail. Uh, so um, in recent years, I've kind of developed a bit of a fascination with the European eel, um, and a fish species that was once so common it comprised as much as 50% of the biomass in any given Western European river. Uh, so the fascination starts with, uh, but it's not limited to the eel's distinctive appearance and biological habits. It's a fantastic life cycle, which has eight distinct phases and it's amazing migration. Uh, all eels are spawned in the Sargasso Sea in the subtropical North Atlantic from where they migrate as larval forms called decephali to Western Europe in a journey which might take as long as three years. Upon arrival, they take up residence in freshwater where they live in a form called the yellow eel for 10 and 20 years or even longer. Uh, and then they transform into silver eels, which is essentially a migratory form and they migrate back to Sargasso. A journey again, which might take up to, up to a year. And in Sargasso, they breed and die. Um, I used to fish for kids when I was little, uh, when I was a kid, uh, but I, 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 Amongst my peer group, I was well known as being a really useless angler. Uh, my dad was into football and cricket, thought so, uh, fishing was boring. So uh, uh, I was never inducted and taught how to fish. All my mates' dads, uh, you know, uh, fishing tackle and so on. So I used to tag along and they'd lend me their second-hand gear. 
and we'd fish on various rivers, including the Wharf and the Don and the Use. And I was so useless that the only fish I could ever catch was eels. To this day, I've never caught any other species other than an eel. And that's because the skill in those days, because eels were so common, was to avoid catching eels. They were regarded as vermin. When you caught an eel, you had to decapitate it and kill it because, you know, they were they were taking your bait that were meant for uh, other fish. So I was amazed to discover that, uh, and this discovery took place, I think, in 2018, the eels, which were verminously common when I was a kid, uh, have declined by 99% over the last 50 years. And they are now red listed by the International Union of Conservation and Nature. And it's partially this decline that has provoked the proliferation of research into the species in recent years. However, although the creation of a, a great deal of new knowledge about eels has shed a great deal of light onto its murky ecology, in doing so, it's paradoxically highlighted the kind of huge gaps that remain. So we, we know so very little about huge tracts of eels ecology. The eel is essentially a dark species, uh, which makes it a very useful species for a writer, because you can project your imagination into it. So as my fascination developed into obsession, I began to trap eels in the streams of the area where I live in Yorkshire. I found they were still there, albeit in much reduced numbers. And I decided to write something about them. Um, so I, I took one of my trap eels home uh, and I kept it in an aquarium for observation. And the, the catalyst for, for the book really happened because I, in my aquarium, it began to transform into silver eel. So it was getting ready to migrate. Uh, it, might, it was changing in front of my eyes kind of week by week. So I knew I had to put it back in the, in, in the stream because I knew that in, uh, in the autumn it would migrate. At that point, I knew what I was going to write. It was going to be a fishy epic. It was going to be like the Odyssey or the Hobbit. It was going to be there and back again, which would tell the story of the eel and the huge range of anthropogenic threats it faces uh, by the imagined life of uh, the little eel that I kept in an, an aquarium for uh, three months. So the European eel is the book that came out of that decision. Uh, and what I'll do now, I'll kind of read three chunks from it. It's a, it's, it's a long book. It's a still poem. It's, a, it's a, a, an epic monology. Steve, uh, Steve, can I just interrupt you just for one second? Yeah. You, your voice is just breaking up a little bit. Oh, is it? it? Uh, yeah, I think it's just when you're moving away from the microphone a little yeah, bit. It, yeah, it's, uh, it's a stupid laptop, so I have to be really close to it. So I'll... Yeah. Uh, my head's got enormous because I put myself right close to it now. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. that's perfect. Thank you is so that okay? much. Yeah. Uh, so um, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read three sections from the book: uh, the beginning, uh, the end, and a section from the middle. So without further ado, I'll I'll read it. Uh, so uh, here we go. So the, this this is the opening of the book. It nar narrates the imagined birth of little eel as a kind of fertilized ovum in the depths of the Sargasso Sea about 100 miles or so offshore from uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, the hatching into a larva or Laptocephalus and the beginning of the three year migration. In the subtropical convergence zone of the Southern Sargasso, over the edge of the Nari's Abyssal, southeast of the Bermuda Ridge, snow is rising in the water column from 1500 feet. Somewhere in Tethys salty darkness, in spurts of milt and billowing row, eels are birthing their posterity. A sparse storm of eggs in uncountable centillions, each void on its micron of oil. The embryos float in the Miocene water like dust motes caught in a shaft of light and ascending through the photocline, join the thermonuclear microplankton of the drifting epipelagic. In the 18 degree water, hatching, it is hypothesized, takes place after two days of embryonic growth, after which emerges the pinhead imago, veined, elongate, a leaf of transparent white willow, leptocephalus, the larval form of anguilla, absorbing its yolk sac for 10 or 12 days, lengthening daily by micrometers, gaining weight daily in micrograms, until a fortnight after hatching, the size of a sand grain or emphatic full stop, it unhinges its tiny gaping jaws, fangs half as long as its head, 
and hunt in the eutrophic blizzard, seizing diatoms, dinoflagellates, polyethylene microbeads, fueling up for the 30 month long haul, sargasso to the Biscay abyssal. Sargasso, a bright lens of brine sitting light on the freeze of the Antarctic bottoms, herded to a hump by the North Atlantic Gaia, the desert sea, life confined to its turbulent edges, the highways of the eel, and the surface rafts of drifting sargassum from which it takes its name, the graveyard sea, swallower of troop ships and Grumman Avengers, where the drowned float forever in zombied suspension and the albatross rots on the mirror. Columbus struck his prow right through it en route to the new world's plunder, but he liked the sargasso. Blue as the sky in Andalusia, fragrant as the air in Seville. The garbage sea of the plastic of three continents forms marks the breadth of Spain. South of the plastic, offshore from Puerto Rico, leptocephali ride on the Antilles current. Feeding at night in the epipelagic, they in daylight descend to the dark of deep scattering, a phototaxic flight from the light and the deaths that lurk there. Harpooning cnidarians, the grip claws of krill, the lit jaws of the lanternfish, devoured in centillions, centillions riding still. A month or so since hatching, the size of an April tadpole, they move in the plankton like Pac-Man, simple machines of growth and devouring, deliverers of the savage telos written in their genes. They drift with the current, making five or 15 miles each day, beyond Grand Bahama to the Blake Escarpment, where the Florida current blows out from the strait on the plume of deep water horizon. There, between Andros Island and Biscayne Bay, it courses into the racing Antilles to form the Gulf Stream, a roaring salt river hurtling north on the edge of the American continental shelf, its estuaries of blight. Estrogen-saturated sewage, methamphetamine neurotoxins, chromosome-warping neonicotinoid runoff. The leptocephali soak it up and tumble to Hatteras with the flotsam of the current. Single-use Canaveral space junk, the strip malls car-tossed fast food trash and radioactive manatees. So this, this journey to Europe from Sargasso goes on for several more pages, but we're going to leap forward here in time. So we've got to imagine this is about 18 years on. Uh, the leptocephala has made it into uh, to Western Europe, has, has found the way along the Humber, and has, uh, has travelled as a yellow wheel right up the Humber system, and is in a tiny beck called the Prickly Beck, which is where I caught Little Eel, where I trapped her. She's now a silver eel, dark above, white below, long finned, huge eyed, muscles packed with fat. And she's poised, ready to be begin her migration back to Sargasso. So she will travel down the Frickley Beck, into the Earbeck, into the Don, to the Ouse, the Humber in the North Sea, the English Channel, into the Atlantic, where she will pick up the North Atlantic Gaia current system at the Azores travel uh, in, in a circular motion towards Africa, then swing across uh, at, uh, uh, probably off, off Ghana, uh, uh, across to the, the Caribbean. Eels begin their migrations uh, in, in September, and they go on until kind of, uh, you know, um, into, into as late as March, really. Uh, they travel on, in, in greatest numbers on cloudy nights during the dark of the moon when there's plenty of water in the river. So here we go. Late September dark moon. Thunderheads massing and snarling. She stirs in her cave in the sycamore root ball. Her black and silver skin is tight. Her rippling snake flesh slick with gleaming fat. She lifts her head and breathes the water, kneading her long pectorals. Eyes like oversized pilot goggles, 
clapped to the sides of her head, rods supplanting cones in the second transformation. She perceives only light and darkness now, the spatial acuity of predatory vision, a redundant inefficiency. 6,000 black and fasting miles to the spawning grounds of the southern Sargasso, over the edge of the Nari's Abyssal, southeast of the Bermuda Ridge. She stretches her length from the submarine tangle and tastes the turbulent swollen waters, recoils from dusk light dimming overhead winds restless through the maze of roots and snags. Stacked cumulonimbus, blacked out constellations, hammering rain stripping the sycamores, field drains foaming with tilth in suspension. Beck risen to the arch of the culvert pipe, leaf litter corks growing under the tunnel in a roaring Coriolis whirlpool. She stretches again from her submarine root ball to sniff in the whelming throat. Nitram, Roundup, Viroxide Super, Superlix Equine Mineral Lick, the olfactory blur of migrating silver eels. She unknots her tail and abandons her length in the current. Flung rope in the torrent, hurtling with debris in suspension. Black blizzards of leaves and broken off branches, cannoning bottles and tins flushed through culverts and under bridges, bent forests of bulrush and torn off mats of flag. She's thundered across the inundated common to the maelstrom confluence with Emsel Beck, where a stubblefield lake is expanding upstream in the whiff of the sewerage outflow. Eel stink tumbling blindly beside her, gray froth of used condoms and sanitary towels ghostly vortex of mewling blackhead gulls. Shot out from the H&B culvert like a cock, she rides the torrent to Carcroft Common, where the ear has broadened to 30 feet and is overtopping its light industrial flood banks. Sodium streetlights glower in siling darkness, but the pummeling current of black white water is too strong to be resisted. She swept on the surge to the confluence with Don. She a volume of flood backing up at the pipe, a surface breaking, wrestling shoal of stymied silver eels. But the gate slammed open by the force of the flux and the suck of the distant German sea. She javelins through and enters the river, having ridden the spate for 16 miles in less than half a night. No weirs on her rivers, not Archimedes' screw, men with fike or wing nets. Darkness and spate keeps the herons from hunting. Pike beat their gills in the shelter of tributary streams. The only hazards, collision and stranding. Don racing with pallets and sundered bankside trees. Unmoored narrow boat, akimbo on the current. River lit with invisible glitter, thousands of silver eels careering under Rawcliffe Bridge, past the brimming drains of Decoy Farm to the swollen ooze at the port of Ghoul. Broad river bellowed to the flat of its levees, freighted with lumber and propane bottles, loose to jetties and half sunk cruisers. Mute swans huge on the dark meniscus, excited grey lag trumpeting overhead. Eels from Derwent, Air and Nid, the trickles of Peak, Dales, Walls and Moors are carried downstream to the Danelaw's vast collision of current. Trent Falls, where tonnage of tumbling mercy and eels join to form the swollen Humber's catadromous flow. Spate pushes back the turning tide from Whitton to Salt End Chemical Park where dawn breaks and the sea shoves back. She sinks with the shoal in the silts of the PNL sea lane and buries herself in the suction dredged deep sands. So that concludes the second reading. The final reading is the closing section of the book. So you have to imagine the journey uh, from, uh, she's, she's at Hull now, uh, 
the journey, uh, which is probably another eight months, takes her uh, along the route that I described. So she's fully silvered. She's made her way back to Sargasso. She's moving into the breeding grounds. She's probably swimming at about half a kilometer in virtual total darkness, uh, operating on smell uh, and the kind of magnetic compass that eels have in their brains, the magnetic maps that they have. And a male, he, uh, a male eel has found her and they are traveling together. He's following her and you know courtship is going to take place, courtship breeding and death is going to take place in the next uh, few days or weeks. And actually it's gonna take place in this poem. Uh, so uh, this, to give you a trigger warning, uh, this poem concludes with eel horn. She's traveling west by north with the current, a curve offshore from windward. Swollen like a pomegranate, a roseate column thick with eggs each microscopic seed of blood lit in its aril of vitaline gold. She winds in the flow like a length of fraying halyard, the edge of coming apart. He's swimming a hundred yards behind her, locked on to her estrogen contrail. They drift for days on the whelming current, moving deeper into the fabled sea. 19 degrees north, 61 west, approaching the rise of the Puerto Rico Trench, a hundred miles north of Barbuda. Blue blackness above, black blackness below, waning crescent, 24% visible, faint glow of deep scatterings, bioluminescence. Diesel growl of longliners, trolling snoods for snapper. Humpback and pilot whales, wahua marlin, picking off the bounty continent of eels coming into fruition as far as fancy's lightless I can see. Little males, 14 inch veterans of the hemispheric journey, hanging limp in the drift like branches of flaccid sargassum, completing their new dual transformation. Others, already come into their ripeness, are riding the pheromone bow waves of females, girthy as pythons, four or five feet long. Soft explosions of pluming milt flare from mesopelagic darkness as all around them eels entwine and jettison their loads. The water stinks of sex and death, progesterone, testosterone, ichthyotoxic blood. She shivers in the warm aphrodisiac current, every nerve and tingling, each tender tip engorged. He's drifting in her orbit now homed in on her cloacal trail. He loops his snaky electron around her. She recoils and snaps her gaping rat trap jaw. Not ready. So for the moment, they simply swim together. The 19 inch female, her underslung bicep of belly and her swollen bootlace suitor. They drift with the current deep into black sargasso. 20 degrees north, 62 west, the outer rise of the Puerto Rico trench, 100 miles north of Anguilla. New moon, 1% visible, crake and darkness, lit only by octopus phosphorescence and the bright detonations of ejaculating eels. They've been traveling in tandem for five days now, through frittering flames of fertilized over and the disarticulate space junk fall of dead and dying eels. This is their predestiny, their inescapable fate, the fate of every Atlantic eel since the Yucatan asteroid dropped its apocalypse 50 million years ago. To ruin themselves in the act of breeding and die in the dopamine afterglow, drifting down from the towering heights of ocean to the black red clays of the five mile abyss, layer upon layer upon Google Plexian layer. Their bodies are coming apart, held together only by shrink wrapped skin and the kamikaze cerebellum that tells them live, to breed and die. They're running on neurosteroids now, their muscular strength exhausted. It's now or never. But her biochemical transformation is finally complete. 
the dark moon shudders in her teleost womb and she suddenly wreathed in sex. He stiffens and begins his dance around her, nosing the waters, advancing and retreating in a tentative submarine hokey cokey, like he's scared to get close, like he's got at least one glaucous eye on that gaping rat trap jaw. She drifts and ignores him, gaping and closing that rat trap jaw, beckoning him forward until he finally plucks up the courage to touch, coming under and rubbing her pulsing belly with the nacelles of his head. He needs the flesh of her underbody with a zigzag massage from pleated throat to vent. She gapes and twitches, swims, and for a while they move touch tight together, him coiling his cable round the rope of her body, constricting and releasing, bringing her to the edge. She gapes and twitches, apparently impassive. But a landslide has started inside her. He uncurls his coils and once more swims beneath her, nuzzling at her leaking vent like a typhoon fueling from a strato tanker, butting the bulge of her loosening rosac, triggering the sensory overload that will release them both into the ecstasy of body, the DMT and oxytocin rush of coitus and extinction. Milt pumps down the tube of his urethra and backs up at the sphincter of the vent. He stiffens and ejaculates a depth charge blast of sperm. She shivers and her gold load slides. They couple in the milk cloud, lit in the shock of its bloom. Once more, he's frotting the flange of her vent and butting the walls of her colon. Once more, he ejaculates again and again until the hypertonic waters are smoky with milk and her shuddering body can hold it back no longer. She cracks like a whip and her body convulses, spurting gusher after gusher of glittering golden over, sparks from the cornucopian flame of Archaea's unkillable dark pleroma, quickening through the mist of sperm and rising through the photocline to join the thermonuclear microplankton of the drifting epipelagic. And that's the end. Thank you. Gosh, just even, even in that short reading, you get a real sense of this enormous story and the force of it and the power of it and this epic journey that's happening. Just in, incredible. And uh, thank you so much, Steve. Thank, thank you. you for being Bless in the magazine and allowing me to speak to you and learn from you and um, coming and reading tonight because it's just, it's, it's glorious. Well, and I... Can't wait for your next book. Really well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to for, to be interviewed and to read tonight. And uh, it, it's a, it's a great pleasure to to read with uh, so many good poets and uh, yeah. uh, um, and this audience and for you, Wendy and Steve, for, for your for your magazine for Stell. So uh, uh, good work for Spell. Sorry, even. Yep. Thank you. I've put a link to uh, Longborough Press where the book can be bought, um, so you can click on it and go and buy it immediately because it oh, is Brian, really. My publisher will like that. Yeah yeah it's really really good it is honestly you just sit down and read with it i was transported by it and that brings us to the end of the evening um it has just been glorious as ever it is fantastic to be in your company and to be working with steve again and to have brought yet another copy of the magazine another issue of the our magazine into the world into physical form after it sort of floats around in our heads for a bit so thank you for being here to celebrate with us if you can all unmute yourselves now and give a warm round of applause to all of the readers the columnists the poets and in particular Steve Ely for coming along tonight thank you so much currently reading for the uh, summer issue you if you submit it to us you might have a, a response by the end of the month I said I would get a response to you by the end of the month and don't forget that the spelt poetry competition is open for entries and Polly Atkin will be judging that and it's got 300 pound first prize and it's worth entering we need more entries into that 
And thank you for supporting Spurt and thank you for being here. And I'm going to let you go and enjoy your Friday evenings now. Take care, everybody. Thank you for coming along tonight. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.